this video by my friend Greg Michelson is a companion to the lecture I put up a week or two ago on entropy and political economy. The two lectures were given by us on the same day for remote transmission uh, to UNAM in Mexico City in 2015. Hello, I'm Greg Michelson from Harriet Watt University. I'm going to be talking about the limits to computing. This lecture is standalone, but it usefully complements and is complemented by Paul Kopchok's lecture. So, in this lecture, I'm going to look at four topics. I'm going to start by looking at models, computers and programs to try and situate what I'm talking about in our everyday experience. Then I'm going to talk a bit about the foundations of computing. I'm going to look a little bit at the logic and mathematics behind computing. I'm going to talk about the limits to computing and paradoxes. And I'm going to talk a bit about the history of the theory of computing. And I'm going to end by talking about the implications of the limits. I'm going to talk a little bit about the philosophical and the economic implications and then draw some conclusions. So I'm going to begin by talking about models computers and programs. So we make models of the world to understand it. The world is too big to comprehend. So we make models that abstract away the essential features. And then by working with a model, we can see how we can change the world in predictable ways. Typically, models aren't just physical semblances. They involve rules that tell us about how the world changes. And often we make our rules in terms of state changes. We think about the old state, how things were before a rule was applied, and the new state, how things have changed after the rule has been applied. Now to describe the world, to make these models, we have to describe qualities of the world. And the basic qualities we tend to use are whether or not something is true or false, and what value something has using numbers. So rules often involve logic and arithmetic. All the time we're using logic and arithmetic just to live in the world. We do this without thinking about it in everyday life, in shopping, in planning, in working out whether someone's argument is sensible or not. And it seems quite likely that our brains in some sense have got rules for logic and arithmetic. Now as we understand more and more about the world, our models become richer and richer. There's a big, big, big growth in the amount of data that we've got to take into our models, and there's a big growth in the complexity of the rules. A good example is weather forecasting, where atmosph atmospheric observations are taken all over the globe and then combined together to try and make predictions of how the weather will change. Now, our brains really can't manipulate very, very large models accurately or quickly. So humans have turned to building machines to help animate the models. First of all, calculators, mechanical calculators, then electronic calculators, and latterly, computers. Digital computers started in the 1940s. They were built originally for designing weapons and for cracking enemy codes. Today, really very short period later, all aspects of our society depend totally on computers. If we lost all our computers, our societies would by and large come to a halt until we remembered how to do things using paper and pencil and using our brains again. Now we're used to computers being really slower than we like and we're used to computers not having enough memory but we assume that they're going to go on getting faster and cheaper. These two computers here show how things have changed in just 40 years. That's an Intel 4004, one of the very first microprocessors. This is an Intel Core i7, already four years out of date. Look at this one here. It's got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 16 connections. This one here has got several hundred connections. It's a measure of how the complexity of computers have changed. They're getting faster and they're getting cheaper. Now, computers really are physical logic machines. They're made of electronic circuits, binary circuits, that really do literally embody the rules of logic. So computers directly capture 
those logical rules that we use for making models and for arguing about models. Computers perform what we call computations. They execute computer programs. The programs capture the rules in our models. The programs are written in programming languages, and the programming languages, again, are based on logic and arithmetic. So let's look at how this all fits together. We start off with thinking about the world and we make a model of some aspect of the world in our brain using logic and arithmetic. Then we write a program and the program captures the logic and arithmetic rules in our brain in rules that a computer can work with. Then we use the computer to animate the program to make the program come alive and that lets us make predictions about the world. If our predictions aren't accurate enough then we change our model and we change our program and we try and predict again. This is a process called computing. Now, models, programs and computers are all connected together by logic and arithmetic, by mathematics. And we take mathematics for granted and we assume in our cultures that ultimately we can find mathematical ways of explaining how very, very complicated aspects of the world work. But maybe there are limits to mathematics. If there are limits to mathematics, mathematics is what computing is based on, then maybe there are limits to computing as well. And that's what I want to talk about next. I'm going to begin to look at the limits of computing by talking about the foundations of computing. We can trace the foundations of computing through the developments of formal logic, set theory, metamathematics, and what's called the Entscheidungs problem, a large German word that I will explain in due course. We're going to very quickly survey these. Here on the right, we can see the advertising for one of the very first computers in the world to go on sale. It was the Ferranti mass production version of the Manchester Universal Electronic Computer. This went on sale about the same time that Univac started selling computers in the United States. So let's begin with propositional logic. Here on the right, we've got Aristotle, who is credited with first formulating the forms of logic that we use now. Logic is for arguing about things being true or false. We make formula equations, and they've got variables A, B, and C, which can stand for things being true or false. We've got operators, we've got and, and or, and not, and implies. So this equation here says that if a implies B, then not B implies not A. If B follows from A, then if B is false, then A must be false as well. A can't be true. Now we use logic to make proofs. Here the man on the right is called George Ball. He first worked out how to formalise proofs and he wrote a book called The Laws of Thought. He really did think that his system captured how thinking works. So a proof is a demonstration that one of these formulas is always true, it's a theorem. There are axioms, which are things that are basic, that we can't question any further, that are always true. For example, if we know A is true, then it follows that A is true. If something's true, then it's true. Okay, a trivial tautology. Then there are rules of inference, which enable us to prove new theorems, new things which are true, from axioms, things we assume to be true, and old theorems, theorems that we proved already. And we write a rule of inference in this form. A implies B, if we know that, and if we know A, then we know that B is true. If our rule tells us that B follows from A, and we know that A is true, then we can always deduce that B is true. Now, propositional logic is only useful for arguing about things being true or false. But we want to be able to argue about a much wider variety of values. And so to do this, we introduce two new constructs. A predicate, which is a mapping from a value to a truth value. So we might say that P is some property of X and it's true or false. And a function, which is a mapping from a value to a value. So F of X returns some value from X. So an example of P of X might be is odd. So is odd of 2 would be true, is odd of 3 would be false. f of x might be adding 1 to x, so add 1 to 1 gives 2, and add 1 to 2 gives 3, for example. But in pure predicate logic, we don't have 
arithmetic or any other values, we just talk about predicates and functions in general. We can also use what's called quantification. Quantification means to do with counting. Universal quantification is to do with checking that something's true for all values of variables. So for example, we might have something that says for all x, if p is true of x, then p is true of f of x. So imagine, for example, that p of x is that x is greater than 1. Imagine that f of x is adding 1 to x. Well, if x is greater than 1, then 1 plus x is greater than 1 as well. Existential quantification is to do with there being a formula that's true for some values. So, for example, for all x and y, if q is true for x and y, then q is true for y and x. So, for example, imagine that q is equality. If x is equal to y, then y is equal to x. That's going to be true for all, but it's certainly going to be true for some as well. So, let's now look at how we can talk not just about things being true and false and having general properties. Let's talk about how we can look at how we can talk about concrete things. Set theory is a way of talking about collections. We can have a set of values like 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, which is a set of powers of 2. We can have sets of sets, so we might have numbers and the words for the numbers. So we've got the set 1 and 1, and the set 2 and 2, and the set 3 and 3. There's a set of sets, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. Operators are member, whether one set's a subset of another set, joining two sets together to take the unique members, or intersecting two sets. So if we join 1, 2, 3 with 2, 3, 4, we get 1, 2, 3, 4. Both sets have got 2, 3, so we've only got one copy of them. If we intersect 1, 2, 3 with 2, 3, 4, well, both sets have only got 2 and 3, so that's where the intersection lies. Now we can build models from a set of things we're interested in, from predicates, from values and sets to truth values, from functions, from values and sets to values and sets, we can talk about all in a set satisfying a predicate and some in a set satisfying a predicate. So let's think about a very small bit of the world, which is the Nordic Union. We've got a set of cities, Copenhagen, Reykjavik, Helsinki, Oslo and Stockholm. We've got a set of states, Denmark, Iceland, Finland, Norway and Sweden. Oslo is the capital of Norway, Copenhagen is the capital of Denmark, Stockholm is the capital of Sweden, Helsinki is the capital of Finland, Reykjavik is the capital of Iceland. So here capital is a predicate that takes a city and a state and tells us whether or not that city is the capital of the state. And then we can write down an argument for every city C there is some state S such that C is the capital of S. So here we've used set theory and a little bit of logic to make a model of states and their capitals. Now we also want to be able to count. We want to be able to say things about numeric properties of sets. And to do this we use arithmetic. Giuseppe Piano, Italian mathematician, was the person who first formalised arithmetic. Very, very simple idea. He said that zero was a natural number, and if x is a natural number, then x plus one is a natural number. So zero is a natural number, one is a natural number, and two is a natural number, and three is a natural number, and so on. And his rule was slightly different to the rule that we saw for propositional calculus. He introduced the rule of induction. He says that if some predicate p is true for 0, and if p is, if we know that p is true for x, and then we can show that p is true for x plus 1, then p must be true for all of x. p is true for 0, we assume p is true for x, we show p true for x plus 1, then we can reasonably conclude p is going to be true for all x, because we can systematically work our way from 0 to show that p is true for 1, or p is true for true, or p is true for 3, and so on. We can then use a technique called recursion to define more complicated operations using 0 and 1. Rosa Peter, the Hungarian mathematician, did a lot of work on recursion. You can show, for example, you can define adding x and y in terms of adding 1 to x and taking 1 away from y. Or in other words, adding 0 to x is x, adding y, adding x to y plus 1 is like adding 1 to x and y. So adding 3 and 2 is like adding 3 and 1 and adding 1 to it, adding 3 and 0 and adding 1 and adding 1, 
adding 3 and 0 gives 3, and adding 1 gives 4, and adding 1 gives 5. Similarly, we could say multiplying x by 0 is 0, multiplying x by y plus 1 is like adding x and multiplying x by y. This is really beginning to look a bit like a programming language. In fact, this is very like what are called functional languages, like standard ML or Haskell, and logic languages like Prolog. OK, so that's a far too quick summary of the foundations of computing, the ideas leading up to computing. Let's now look at where the limits to computing come from. OK, programs written in programming languages. We're going to reason about our programs, and to do reasoning we need another language. So we're going to use what's called a meta language, a language of talking about languages. Right now I'm using English to talk about mathematical languages, about programming languages, and also about English itself. We can use English to reason about software. We already use English to reason about English, and that shows us that a natural language, a human language, can be its own meta language. Indeed, it has to be, otherwise we'd have no way of teaching language to children. When we're teaching children to speak and to read and to write, we use our language to explain to them their mistakes. So they're using the language to learn the language. Now, languages which can talk about themselves are prone to paradoxes. A paradox is a statement that seems to simultaneously state its truth and its falsehood. And the fundamental rule in reasoning is that if the statement gives rise to a paradox, to a contradiction, then the statement is unacceptable. So a very early paradox is called the Lyre Paradox. It's after Epimenides. He was a Cretan, and he said that Cretans are always liars. We can reformulate this as this statement is false. So let's think about this. Suppose the statement's true, then the statement's false, so the statement isn't false, so the statement's true. Let's suppose the statement is false, so the statement isn't false, so the statement's true, so the statement's false again. So here we have this peculiar self-contradictory statement. This statement is false. It both affirms its own truth and its own falsity. Let's look at a more recent paradox after German mathematician called Kurt Grelling. Grelling says that words can be autological or heterological. An autological word applies to itself. So polysyllabic is a word with more than one syllable, so it's a polysyllabic word. Heterological words don't apply to themselves. Monosyllabic has got more than one syllable, so it's not a monosyllabic word. So Grelling asked, is heterological a heterological word? Well, let's assume heterological is heterological. So it does apply to itself, so it isn't heterological. Let's assume it's not heterological, so it doesn't apply to itself, so it is heterological. Now, in 1901, Bertrand Russell, the British mathematician, showed that set theory, the theory that we talked about slightly earlier, is contradictory. In set theory, it's powerful enough to generate self-references his paradox is known to do with the set of all sets which are not members of themselves. I'm going to reconstruct this using a well-known example of a library. So a library's got books, so here we've got a collection of economics books and computing books. And let's suppose we've got a catalogue for the books in each subject. So we've got a catalogue of economics books and a catalogue of computing books. And let's suppose we've got a catalogue for the whole library so the economics books are in the economics catalogue, the computing books are in the computing catalogue, but all the books are in the library catalogue. Now, the subject catalogues are books as well, so let's put them in the library catalogue. And the library catalogue is a book as well, so let's put it in the library catalogue. So here we've got a catalogue that includes itself. Now, clearly, some catalogues don't include themselves. The economics catalogue isn't an economics book, the computing catalogue isn't an isn't a computing book. So let's have a catalogue of books that aren't in themselves. That's going to include the economics catalogue and the computing catalogue, but it's not going to include the library catalogue because the library catalogue does include itself. So the paradox is, does the new catalogue include itself? If it does include itself, then it shouldn't. And if it doesn't include itself, then it should. So here, using library, using catalogues, we've constructed a paradox which is a direct analogue of Russell's paradox. 
Russell and his colleague Whitehead went on to try and show that just starting with simple propositional symbolic logic, you could derive all the mathematics. And they wrote a book, came out finally in 1913, called Principia Mathematica, that takes two very large volumes to establish very, very basic facts about mathematics. The German mathematician David Hilbert then said it would be really nice if there'd be some way of showing that Russell and White had really had captured fundamental properties of mathematics. Is their formalization, is it consistent? There are no contradictions, no paradoxes. Is it complete? There aren't any theorems that we can't prove. And most important for this talk, is it decidable? Is there an algorithm? Is there a set of rules? Is there, if you like, a program which we can give an arbitrary formula to and it tells us whether or not it's a theorem? And he called this the Entscheidung's problem, the problem of deciding mechanically whether or not a mathematical form formula is a theorem. Well, Kurt Gödel, the Austrian mathematician, showed in 1931 that Russell and Whitehead's mathematics is incomplete. And he showed that there are things that are plainly theorems which can't be proved to be true. I'm not going to show you Gödel's theorem, but basically he demonstrated that you can represent mathematics in itself just using piano arithmetic and recursion, and he could construct a theorem that stated that it wasn't a theorem. He was able to make a self-referential contradiction. Okay, in the UK, the mathematician Alan Turing took a slightly different approach. He took a literal understanding of doing computing and thought about how to build a machine that would actually perform argument using symbols. So he came up with the idea of a Turing machine. It's got a tape that's got cells on each cell you've got a symbol, just an ordinary letter. The tape can move left or right, and the machine can look at the current cell on the tape, and it's controlled by rules that say, if I'm in an old state looking at a symbol, I can change to a new symbol, new state, I can change the symbol, and I can change the direction of the tape. Now, a Turing machine describes a specific computation like a computer program. Turing came up with the idea of a universal Turing machine which is effectively an interpreter for any Turing machine and a tape description. The universal Turing machine behaved like a computer, like a central processing unit for which Turing machines are the programs. And so for Turing, the Entscheidung's problem, can we tell mechanically whether or not a formula is a theorem, turned into, if we've got an arbitrary Turing machine with arbitrary data, can we tell whether or not it halts? You can think about the arbitrary Turing machine being a theorem, the arbitrary data being, if you like, all the possible truth values it might take. Can we mechanically decide whether that Turing machine will halt? Is that theorem true for all the possible values you can put into it? So we're going to do a proof by contradiction. We're going to make a paradox. Let's assume we can write a program called a halting tester. And we put into this halting tester the code for a program, the code for a Turing machine. If the Turing machine halts, the halting tester says yes. If the Turing machine doesn't halt, the halting tester says no. Okay, in goes the program. If it stops, the program says yes, the halting tester says yes. If it doesn't stop, the halting tester says no. Let's make a new version. This is a little bit tricksy. We're going to put the program into the halting tester. If the halting tester says that the program doesn't stop and the halting tester says no, if the halting tester decides that the program does stop, then the halting tester just goes round and round and round forever, not doing anything, never saying yes. So if the program doesn't stop, the halting tester tells us that it does stop. If the program does stop, then the halting tester never ever stops. It just goes on looping forever. OK, here comes the paradox. Here comes the contradiction. We're going to take the code for our new halting te tester, which is it's just a program, and we're going to give it to itself. We're going to ask, does the halting tester running on itself halt or not? And we get a paradox. If our non-halting tester stops, then it doesn't say no, it loops forever. And if our non-halting tester doesn't stop, then it does stop and it says no. So we conclude we've got a paradox. We can't tell if the non-halting tester stops or not when running itself, so we can't build the non-halting tester so we can't build the halting tester. The Entscheidung's problem is undecidable. 
there is no mechanical way of telling whether or not a formula is a theorem or not. OK, so what are the implications of this? Well, they're kind of deep. The church, who was another mathematician this time in the United States, came up with a different model of computing called lambda calculus, and he and Turing showed that lambda calculus and Turing machines are actually equivalent. Anything you can do with the Turing machine, you can do in lambda calculus. Anything you can do in lambda calculus, you can do with the Turing machine. And it's been shown that any model of computability has this property. It's the Turing thesis, all models of computability are equivalent. An instance of one can be translated into an instance of another. In another sense, you can write an interpreter for one in any other. Now, this applies not only to these mathematical theories, but also to von Neumann machines, to real digital computers. It applies also to real programming languages. So in particular, we've shown that the halting problem is undecidable. So the halting problem for real programs on real computers is also undecidable. But we often want to know that the software really does stop. If we're standing in an automated lift, we really don't want it to keep on going and bang off the bottom. If we're in hospital having drugs administered, we'd like the drug machine to stop giving us drugs. We don't want to get an overdose. In the same way, we want to know the software doesn't stop. If we've got an artificial heart, we don't want it to stop beating. If our aircraft is landing in a storm on the autopilot, we don't want the autopilot to suddenly cut out. If we're controlling a power station, we don't suddenly want our nuclear power station to stop working. So we often really do want to know that our programs stop or our programs don't stop. But the halting problem shows us that we can't tell in general. And if we can't tell if an arbitrary program stops, then we can't tell how long a program's going to take, we can't tell how much memory it's going to need, we can't tell how much power it's going to consume, and that's got lots of real-world implications. If we're using a computer to solve a problem, it would be nice to know we'll get an answer in a decent amount of time. If we're buying a computer, to run a large process and we want to make sure we buy enough memory. We don't want to have to go on adding memory because we've not predicted adequately how much memory it needs. And we really want to know how much power our computers consume. It's tedious having to recharge a mobile phone or a laptop even once a day. Now, there are deep philosophical implications. Alan Turing actually didn't think there were philosophical implications. In his 1950s paper on uh, computers and intelligence, he argues, I think very convincingly, that humans are machines. For sure, humans are not made out of mechanics, they're not made out of electronics, they're made out of protoplasm, they're made out of cells and nerves, all driven by chemicals and electricity. But he says, nonetheless, humans are machines, and if humans are machines, they've got the same limits as computers. If the halting problem applies to computers, it also applies to humans. Now, people have disagreed with this. So, Nagel and Newman looked at Gödel's result and said, look, come on, Gödel could see that mathematics was incomplete, humans can identify these paradoxes in mathematics, so maybe human reasoning is more powerful than mathematical reasoning. Maybe it's possible that humans can do things that computers can't do. In this particular case, actually, Nagel and Newman seem to have been wrong, because in 1994, Shankar produced a computer proof of Gödel's theorem. I think the important point is that humans need to learn mathematics, and so do computers. It's ridiculous to expect a computer to be able to do anything you haven't taught it to do, just as it's ridiculous to expect a human to do anything you haven't taught them to do. They're both machines, they both need to learn how to do things. For sure they can do different sorts of things, but they've got the same limitations. Now, from your point of view, there are actually strong economic implications. The Austrian school are very, very fierce critics of economic planning. This actually is from the Mises website, this pop calculator with the keys all jumbled up saying socialism can't calculate. This is part of an article to do with the economic calculation debate where they are disputing all the claims of colleagues that socialist planning is a feasible and a right way to run an economy. Most recently, people from the Austrian school are using ideas that derive from computability theory to say that economic planning is uncomputable. They're using philosophical arguments from the limits of computing. So, for example, Burtker and Subrick quote an American philosopher called John Sowell. John Sowell makes an argument that human intelligence isn't computational. 
He says that humans are able to process semantics, that is meanings, but computers can only process syntax, that is symbols. He says that symbols, words on bits of paper, don't have anything like the same strength or power as a human being understanding the words. And he says computers are based on symbols, and all they're doing is just working the symbols, so really if planning is based on computers, it's not going to be able to catch in the semantics of economies, which are based on human actors. He's essentially putting the argument, humans can do things that computers can't do, mathematics is limited, computers are limited, but human beings who process semantics aren't limited in the same way. Now, Paul Kotchot and Cottrell have argued that Searle's argument is fundamentally flawed. They argue that human actors are computational, and they argue in particular that Burke and Subrick are misusing the syntax-semantics distinction. Murphy, more recently, has used a rather different technique called counter-diagonalisation that really has its origins in showing that there are more real numbers than integers, which I won't go into here. But he argues that for economic planning to work, you've got to somehow take into account an infinite number of potential commodity inputs. It isn't enough just to think about all the commodities that people actually make. Maybe production could involve commodities that people haven't thought of yet. So maybe we need to take all of those into account, and there's an infinite number of them, so planning is going to be uncomputable. And again, Alan Cottrell, Paul Cockshot and myself have argued that this is a complete misapplication of ideas from computability, and on every cycle of planning, only a finite number of inputs is required. OK, so we've made really quite a long journey in a very, very short space of time. We started by summarising, as I think we'll all agree, that computers are at the heart of almost all socio-economic activity. And I've shown you very briefly how computers are used to animate models, to make models come alive, and how models are based on mathematics and logic. I've shown you how self-referential languages engender these really tricksy paradoxes, and I've shown how logic and mathematical paradoxes limit what models can do, what computers can do, and ultimately what human beings can do. If you'd like to find out more about this, then what I can strongly recommend is the advertising slot, these two excellent books. There's Paul, Lewis Mackenzie and my book on computation and its limits. Chapter 4 is an expanded version of much of this lecture. Paul Allen, my, Yakovenko and Ian Wright's book on classical economics has chapters dealing with computability in economics and on refutation of the Austrian school's arguments. Thank you very much.